I think it implies the existence of formerly bisexual literature, and I want to find exactly, this literature where, right? where we fucking get to go to the Met. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Business class bisexual. Hello and welcome to Love Lives, a podcast from The Independent where I, Olivia Petter, will be speaking to different guests every fortnight about the loves of their life. This week, I am so excited to be joined by the brilliant author Nisha Dolan. Nisha is the best-selling author of one of my favorite books, Exciting Times. I'm so excited to speak to her today about her new novel, The Happy Couple, as well as hearing all about the loves of her life. Hi, Nisha. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. As I said, I'm a huge fan of your work and I'm going to get on to talking about The Happy Couple, but I want to start off by asking you a bit about exciting times because obviously that came out in the pandemic and to such success so quickly. And, you know, as a debut author, I can imagine that is quite an overwhelming feeling, but particularly when you can't go anywhere and you're in lockdown and you're doing all of these interviews from behind a screen. What did you make of the response to that book and the subsequent attention that that brought you? Well, like you say, there was an almost dot-com air to the whole thing where conceptually I'm aware that people are reading it, but there's no tactile node to attach that to. I'm not seeing any faces when I speak. I'm not going into shops and seeing it on shelves. So there was definitely then a lag between what I intellectually understood and what I had embodied and felt. And I'm also not an absolute pro at feeling my feelings anyway. <laughs> so if I had had a conventional launch and experience, I might well also have had an experience of zoning out a bit initially and only catching up with it later when I had a bit of space too. But I think in other ways, it was probably a softer landing than it would have been if I'd had to cope with a lot of different things at once. I wasn't a particularly seasoned public speaker in my capacity as me. I had done a lot of university debating, but you can really hide behind whatever argument you're advocating then. There's not the same pressure that a week from now people will ask you if you still think this thing that you um, espoused on a stage. So getting used to conversing publicly as me, but without as much of an audience, I think I landed a bit more softly that, in that way. Mm. And for those who haven't read Exciting Times, could you tell us what it's about, Ruthie? It's a novel where the first person narrator is a young Irish woman who goes to Hong Kong and gets a job teaching English to young children and has two love affairs, one with a male British banker and another with a female lawyer who's locally from Hong Kong but was educated abroad. I would say... The main crux of the action isn't so much cho choosing between these two people as the character's own uncertainty about her place in life. And so that's really where the tension lies for her. But over the book, she comes away towards resolving it, even if there isn't a pat ending. Mm. And it resonated so much with readers, I think, for so many reasons. But I think one in particular that struck me was that it was one of the first depictions in fiction of that very modern type of relationship that people call a situationship <laughs> where there's no kind of definable label to it. Um, and I know that, you know, like I said, because it was such a huge hit, you had so much press coverage. And then I read an interview recently where someone described you as a literary it girl. I wanna know what you think of that label and that term and it being applied to you. It's quite a pronoun, it, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's curious in that to get to the point where anyone would plausibly call you any such thing, you need to have a very self-contained understanding of yourself and what you do. You will never write a good book if you pay too much attention to external praise or recognition. But then suddenly there are these terms that really exclusively define how other people are reacting to you. But to me, it girl connotates that people could not necessarily have made any encounter with your work and still know who you are. Yeah. And that really doesn't feel like anything that I ever set out to do or know how to respond to. Yeah. Um, I, I sometimes feel like there's a separate character which is the composite of all my interviews and the mosaic that, that maybe forms if someone sits down and reads all of them. I don't know why someone would do such a thing to themselves, but if they were to. Um, 
And so then increasingly when I meet people, they do have an idea of me that might, mightn't necessarily have corresponded to me at the time that I did the interview, because that's usually about the journalist more than about me. But even if it did correspond at the time, it might have been from two or three years ago. But I... I think I just roll with it to the best of my ability. That is generally my approach to yeah. roll. I think that's the best thing to do. I mean, because it's funny, it's kind of literary It Girl, I think is kind of an oxymoron in and of itself because like there was all this coverage about It Girls recently in that New York Magazine piece and they described the It Girl as, you know, someone who doesn't really have a job. Like it's kind of the definition of it is sort of their mystique and the fact that you don't really know what they do or how they spend their lives. So to have like a literary it girl, it seems very strange. It's sort of, in a way, it's almost like, I'm sure it's meant as a compliment, but I can imagine it feels like almost slightly reductive in a way. <laughs> well, also the literary kind of implies a certain um, scale here that isn't necessarily reminiscent of the scale associated with it girls. To be famous in the literary world might mean that you have a few Instagram followers as opposed to a truly interesting number that would make people send you free moisturiser. That is what I long for. <laughs> uh, free moisturiser, yeah. <laughs> free anything, to be honest. Um, now let's move on to talk about your new book, The Happy Couple. So it also focuses on relationships as the title suggests, but can you tell us what that's about? It's about a young couple who at the start of the novel decide to get married and then we follow them, a guest, the best man and the bridesmaid who take turns narrating the action as we tick down to this wedding. I would say it's a bit more playful with perspectives than exciting times could be because that was through the head of a first person narrator. I still try to sneak other perspectives into the novel but you're always working a little bit against the form when you do that. Whereas with this one, I've really embraced this possibility of showing different people's take on the same incident and playing them off each other and having everyone be the villain in someone else's eyes, which is what I love doing. Yeah, I think that really works so well with this story because it's such a complicated sort of relationship from so many angles. So to have all those different perspectives where, like you said, there is everyone has their own villain and their own kind of narrative, which is so reflective of contemporary relationships. You know, no one is really going to be the own villain in their own story, but you're probably someone's, or you're probably always going to be someone else's villain. <laughs> yes, it, it's the dark underside of main character syndrome. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> someone exactly. else's villain syndrome. Yeah. Um, the book features this quote that I just love. I think it really captures so many of the kind of anxieties about modern relationships and the way that we talk about them today, particularly, you know, we're very quick to kind of therapize people um, and therapize ourselves, regardless of whether or not we've actually had the therapy to give us that kind of understanding. We've seen the Instagram pictures, which is essentially the same thing. Exactly, yeah. So one of the things you write, you write that love is letting someone hurt you Archie, who's one of the characters, must have learned it from someone too. We all learn it from somewhere, but some of us get over it and some of us terrorize the general population well into our 20s and beyond. <laughs> it's so good and so accurate. Um, I want to ask how true you think that is and where you think we learn that conditioning from. Like, do we learn it from our childhood? Do we learn it from previous relationships? Do we learn it from pop culture? Why are so many of us going around terrorizing people? <laughs> Nietzsche would have a take on this, <laughs> but personally, I think it's probably not any one thing. It's a composite of all the influences you cited and more. And probably a lot of the time it stems from an adaptive response to our childhoods because it's terrifying to believe that you're not being competently cared for or supported as a child. And actually it gives you at least an illusion of control if you think that the problem is you and that you can make the environment work for you by just trying to need less or by just trying to tolerate more. And that's often very convenient for others. And so nobody's ever going to make you stop doing that. And so if it's immediately adaptive and if no one's prompting you to change it, you can end up reproducing it over and over. And I think probably there's no dynamic we're on one side of in one situation that we don't end up on the other side of in another situation because if you're letting someone hurt you and rationalizing that as acceptable behavior, that region of your brain that you're building that thinks that's okay doesn't go away when you're de then dealing with someone who might put you in the opposite position. And so that's how I think we end up repeating these cycles. And 
the nice thing about being a novelist is you just need to observe and you've done something by depicting something that exists. Mm. You, you've done your bit. You don't Someone need else to can really understand yeah, it. No, I, I never yeah. need to give any counsel in sessions. <laughs> yeah. Thank God, I would be dreadful. <laughs> God, yeah, so would I. I can barely counsel myself. Um, I also want to ask you about the ways um, one of the characters, Vivian, kind of dismantles the concept of the one, um, which is obviously so relevant to this story and is so often applied to heterosexual marriage situations you know it's like you're my one this is my fate you're my soulmate and whatever it's obviously a very kind of archaic idea but we still really cling on to it I think so so tightly um to our own detriment I think why do you think we do is is it is it a comforting idea to does it kind of relinquish responsibility in a way yes I think you're on the money about that I think it's very easy to then outsource the work that we should be doing continuously in our lives, in our daily interactions to this imaginary person who is meant to one day materialize. And even when one has an actual partner and is trying to make them fit that mold, it still doesn't always come about. I think it's a way to feel victimized by circumstance mm. when actually there are many things that you can do to make human interaction work for you like take an interest in people who aren't your partner and so it, it's comforting in that it excuses a lack of curiosity about life in general in favor of a mold that probably never substantially really existed yeah. but that maybe stops us from exploring the possibility of real connection in a more diluted diverse way Mm, and looking for someone to save us as opposed to saving ourselves, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. um, I, this novel is obviously, you know, another examination of millennial relationships, as was your first. What is it that draws you to kind of exploring that in your work? Is it, is it intentional or is it sort of just accidental that this book just happened to be another book about, you know, kind of young, young people in a relationship? Well, I think if I know about something in real life that I've read relatively little fiction about, that will always seem like a natural thing to write fiction about because the bar is so much lower to say something new. That's not to say that if I thought I had something truly novel to weigh in on with a very dumb thing, I wouldn't write it. But it's a lot less likely that my thoughts will be novel if I try to write about people my parents' age yeah. because they've already written plenty of their own novels about that. But at the same time, I think there is a goldfish memory symptom in literature where we forget how many things are just true of being young. And because a given generation are seen as the present day young people, even when now like millennials are 40, <laughs> um, but I guess so many of the traditional markers of adulthood aren't as attainable now. And so that probably stretches out the timeline. But for instance, I think Exciting Times has parallels in some ways with The Catcher in the Rye. There's the same element of the voice that's in some ways knowing and in other ways naive, almost in its attempts to seem knowing. And that's probably always what slightly bratty narrators of a certain age bracket are like. Yeah, totally. I think every, I mean, yeah, every young person thinks they know it all and is going to be completely unaware of their own kind of shortcomings and misgivings. And, you know, the worst thing you can say to a young person as an older person is to condescend them. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting as a narrator to have just that voice, because it's like as the reader, you have to bring your own self-awareness to that perspective in order to grasp that. Yeah, yeah. And I think when older people label novels about young people, specifically millennial literature, there's an amnesia the opposite way sometimes. Sometimes people of a sudden age will ask me, why does the heroine of the first one make such bad decisions? And I'm just thinking, do you forget what it's like to be 22? It's bad decision yeah. city. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, so if they were making good decisions, what's the novel? Yeah. Where's the drama? Precisely. <laughs> One uh, label that has been applied to your work, um, which I think says a lot about our culture, is it's been called casually bisexual. Um, to me, that label kind of just highlights how unaccustomed people still are to seeing queer relationships in fiction. Um, what do you make of that label being applied to your work? And, and, you know, is it something that you feel comfortable with or do you kind of just like let it roll, like, like you said earlier? Well, I think it implies the existence of formerly bisexual literature. And I want to find exactly, this literature where, right? where we fucking get to go to the Met. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Business class bisexual, please. So true, yeah. <laughs> but, um, Business class bisexual. 
<laughs> yeah, but I think what it's getting at is that it's seen as rare for literature to not problematize the fact that someone is gay and make it the source of conflict in the novel. There's a grain of truth there in terms of what art mainstream culture has traditionally upheld and celebrated. But I also think for decades at least, there have been books that have obviously done that. And for centuries, there have been books where we all know the characters are gay, even though it's not stated. In some ways, that's the original casual, like the picture of Dorian Gray is way more casual than my book in that it doesn't a single time have um, overt allusions to homosexuality. So there's a grain of truth in terms of the need for it to be as easy for a random person walking into a shop to pick up books where the characters are gay and it's not a problem. But there's also an element of, is this really that new? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I, it, was, it just really struck me that it was described like that. It felt very kind of like myopic in a way. Yeah. Um, you recently wrote a piece for The Guardian about attending your first ever wedding at the start of this year. And by that point, you'd written The Happy Couple, which obviously revolves around an upcoming wedding between the two main characters. But I really liked what you said in the piece about how the fact that we celebrate marriage so much in our culture, because I know that, you know, you were kind of asked by your publishers, like, what, what do you mean? You've never been to a wedding and you've written a book about a wedding. And you're like, well, no, because marriage is so celebrated and so kind of normalized in our culture, it's very easy to write about a wedding without ever having been to one. So having now attended your first wedding, I'm curious how that affected your view on weddings and marriage generally, if, if it did. I think because the two experiences were so different, it was hard for one to color the other in that the book bears no relation to anything that I've ever tangibly seen or experienced, whereas the wedding was so specific to the two people doing it. Although maybe that's telling in that day and age that young people now can create a truly special experience for them and have it at every stage reflect what they want, not what their parents want or not what a given tradition has dictated. So for instance, my friends got a bunch of us to give short speeches about the stage of our lives where we met the bride or the groom. And it really made it personalized. But for that reason, to compare it with the rather abstract treatment I give it in my novel, it, I'm glad that I wrote the novel before I had attended this one wedding because it was so vivid and fun that it would have really coloured what I wrote. But you can't write a novel about a nice, fun wedding where you're glad that the people are getting married and it all goes well. Let's move on to the loves of your life. So the first one is a drink, but I think the reason that you've chose it seems to be a lot more than just about the flavor of why you like it. So tell us why you've chosen coffee. Right, because I would say the source of any ambient anxiety in me as I go about my day is usually the sense that my problems are far bigger than me and I can do nothing but gesture towards solving them. And so when there's an immediate urge or pain that I can fix and I know exactly why it's there and how to get rid of it. It feels like a therapeutic um, soft way of rehearsing what it would look like to fix the bigger problems even when I still can't fix them. So another example of this would be um, the maths training website that I go on every day and I do these very short mental arithmetic puzzles. I think it's called mathtrainer.io or something. I am now the fifth best in Berlin at this. Wow. I am sure oh the rest of my competition is teenagers. <laughs> however. <laughs> Still something, counts for something. Yeah, so taking an immediate problem, having to work a bit to fix the problem, but then it's fixed. Yeah. Not an overwhelmingly modern experience, and not the general vibe when you check the news. And so it, it can be nice. And that's what coffee does. I feel it coursing through me and my day has improved. I love that. I think it's such an interesting way to look at the kind of daily rituals that we have in our life. Because, you know, like you said, we, we don't have control over so many of the kind of anxieties and things that we experience on a day-to-day basis. And there are actually very few things we can do that immediately rectify a problem. And I was trying to think of other examples of this and the only ones I could think of, you know, I mean, the the maths thing is probably a very, very healthy example, but mine were all like smoking, taking drugs. Like it was all like quite 
toxic behaviors of like getting that quick fix because it kind of makes you think of addiction. And I, I know people can be addicted to caffeine, but it just made me think like, we need more of these kind of quick fix solutions that aren't going to have a negative impact on our body and mind because <laughs> actually it just helps give us a degree of control, I guess. Yeah, well, not to be Mary Poppins about it, but I think you can do it with any small, annoying tasks. Like I find if I just submit to the fact that I'm going to be fully present in what I'm doing, I can usually end up enjoying it. It's only if I'm half doing it and half worrying about something else that I then find the thing unpleasant. Because if you're worrying about something that's way more important than the dishes, then it becomes tedious to do the dishes. Mm. But if I do the dishes while only thinking about the dishes, you get a nice cheap little dopamine hit and you don't even need to check your notifications. So. Mm. How do you go about having your coffee then? Do you have it first thing when you wake up? Do you make it at home? Do you buy it out? Like what's your kind of coffee routine? I only keep instant in the house because otherwise my intake creeps up too far more than any human system can handle. Oh, really? <laughs> but I at least try to make it visually appealing. And the thing is because it's the first coffee, it still tastes delicious. Mm -hmm because I am a starving woman and have zero options. And so my body still adores it. If it were the second coffee, I would throw it right up. But um, I, t I make a little instant espresso and I have a little white espresso cup and a little white dish. They cost maybe collectively two euro, but they bring me a lot of pleasure. Yeah, those, I have I have like a tiny little espresso cup and like a little milk jar. And it's like even the silly ritual of filling up the milk jar to then pour it into the jar. As opposed to like pour milk into the jar first. It's, it's nice. I don't know what it is. It's like satisfying. Yeah, why does something only to... Like all it has to do is just be smaller than the thing as you usually see it. Like it's true of cats. Kittens are more delightful than a grown cat, although yeah. I love grown cats also. Yeah. Children. Coffee. <laughs> Children depends on the child. Yeah. <laughs> no, true, true, true. Well, but they probably yeah. won't grow into a better adult, I guess, is the point. True. It's true. Yeah, it's just when you said children, my first thought was like screaming the child on a plane. It's <laughs> like, I don't care how small you are, be quiet. Um, I want to move on to your second love. So you have chosen visual art. What exactly do you mean by that phrase, visual art, um, first of all, and why have you chosen that? The type that I make is very narrow. I will usually just do biro drawings and my aims will be purely figurative, but I'll end up enjoying the slant that I put on it. Maybe because that tells me something about how I perceive the world or maybe because I just love the reality that even if you get a bunch of people into a room who don't have any particularly high amount of artistic training and you ask them to draw the same thing, they will all still have a unique take on it. And because I don't ever particularly need to be good at art, I can enjoy the uniqueness even when the uniqueness is bad. And the fact that it's in biro means that I don't get persnickety about mistakes. I have to just work with them. And when I do my main job on a laptop where everything is eminently deletable at all times, <laughs> that's a pleasant change. But then the art that I enjoy has a much wider range. I love going into a museum and looking at things for a very long time, often without having any context at all. And on another level, I find art history fascinating, but I almost pursue that separately to the experience of just being with a painting for a bit. I think maybe it's linked to having another artistic activity as my job, because then in order to get the psychological release that I once got from art, where I can do it without any consideration at all about contracts or how it's going to be received or how it compares to things I've previously done or anything. Yeah, visual art is a pleasant way to keep up that pure, yeah. almost childlike engagement, I guess. Yeah, I think childlike is a really good way of describing it because I think it's so easy when making art of any form becomes your profession. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that, you know, fundamentally, this is about play you know, in any way, and, you know, whether it's theatre or writing or painting, and it's so easy to lose sight of that. And then if the second you start creating art purely for commercial gains, you lose the kind of the purity of it, I suppose. Yes, I, I think not irretrievably. Mm. And this is the nice thing about my brain, because the downside is I cannot ever make myself do something that requires a lot of focus unless I find the thing inherently enjoyable. This often occasions a lot of disaster in my life. 
But it does mean that when I'm in focus, I'm able to cast aside all the considerations about the industry and the reality of getting a thing made and seen through. Mm. And in that moment, I'm just there with the characters. But I think having the parallel pursuit of something where that's always the case and there's never any external pressure then helps me get into that zone more with writing. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I want to ask you about like your kind of writing routine then, because in one of your, um, when you when you sent over your loves, you said that sometimes you can find writing can be quite draining, whereas creating visual art isn't in the same way. What is it about the writing process that you find draining? And do you have, yeah, like I said, you have like a writing routine because it's, every writer is different. You know, some people will write for three hours a day. They'll just write in the morning and then in the afternoon they'll exercise or go for a walk or whatever. And some will just kind of sit at their desk from like nine to nine to five. Some will do nothing nine to five and then work in the evenings or in the early mornings. What What's your approach? I think what tends to drain me is the level of choice and being able to foresee the implications of those choices. And so when I'm picking a given name for a character, I can see the full range of qualities that I might associate with that name. I can see the names that sound a bit like that name that I now can't give another character. Or a, you can imagine that for every other tiny consideration along the way. And so usually what I end up doing is in some way constraining my choice. So for the second novel, I just decided, right, it's going to be about a wedding. There are going to be I think I started with three narrators who all took turns, like ABC, ABC, then two more kind of <laughs> snuck in. <laughs> and um, the, the structure ended up not so rigid because I later moved things around. Yeah, so that initial constraint was very freeing. Georges Perec is probably the writer who's influenced me the most in terms of that approach. I think most famously he wrote a novel without the letter E. <laughs> I, ha I haven't gone quite that far, but uh, that's definitely a range of approaches that guides me and then on a more practical where physically do I go level it's the same principle when I'm overwhelmed by choice I will limit myself in some way I like cafes for that reason because the range of things that I can productively do in a cafe is much smaller than the range of things I can productively do in my own home that's so true yeah I, I can't go and help clean the cafe for yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or I do your laundry yeah oh my yeah. god I relate to that so hard I'm like I'm just gonna like go put my stuff I'm just gonna go wash my sheets like, yeah instead of finishing this paragraph <laughs> yeah but also I'm very bad at sitting in an ergonomic way so I like to keep moving throughout the day so at least whatever disastrous posture I adapt I won't be there for too long so mm -hmm. I'll break it up with a lot of movement, but I don't like to break up anything that's cognitively taxing. So I like windows where I'm moving around a lot, but I'm not having to intensely focus on anything besides writing. So I try to limit my internet time for that reason. And I'll write things out by hand a lot too. There is the pitfall here that I get very bored typing it up. And so I try not to write too much by hand because I know later me will despise present me for doing that. <laughs> But it's good for getting an initial flow going because of the same constraint factor. Yeah, yeah, I do that too. I kind of like jot down lots of ideas like on notepads and kind of on my phone. But then, yeah, if I ever write anything too full and then I come to type it, I'm just like, why did I do that? And it's just so frustrating. I'm like, how did people write full books just on paper with a pen? I'm like, my hand cramps up. I just can't do it. Well, I think the old male author approach was you get your wife to type it. Oh God, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> I sadly do not have a wife. Or, or write it in, in many cases as well. Um, and so your final love, um, you have chosen something very unique that I love. Tell me why you've chosen Meeting Strangers. Yes, I love this. Um, first of all, because it's one of the easiest ways to make something that would be boring more interesting. When I'm in a taxi, if the driver clearly doesn't want to talk, then I will respect their wishes on this point and let them just do their job. But if they do want to talk, that's so much more fun than whatever else I could be doing in that taxi. And my most recent encounter was with a second generation Irish taxi driver named Jan. So we had a great chat about her experiences coming over to the UK when she was very small. And you don't see that kind of history recorded too often. There are things about it, small details like what her parents brought with them or the kind of flat that they lived in when they came there that you're not necessarily gonna get in a history book. And I think a writer really can't afford to 
be particular about what they want to learn. Certainly for me, because I don't start my books with any particular focus, I just see what comes up as I write. So I like stocking my inventory of things that I know can be true of people and then Maybe it'll come out eventually, maybe it won't. Either way, it's good to know. Yeah, that's so true, actually. And I think, you know, that, that story in and of itself highlights how much value there is, you know, whether you're a writer or not, but just in engaging with strangers and, you know, the idea of just talking to people you wouldn't normally come across. And I think it's something our culture really doesn't value and really doesn't prioritise in any way. Like, I had to write an article once where I was tasked with talking to strangers on the tube and um, you can imagine how well that went. I would literally sit down and kind of turn to someone and be like, hi, how are you? And people would honestly look at me and just look back. <laughs> and that was it. Like they were so bold in the way that they, I do not care, I do not want to talk to you <laughs> and just turn away. Um, and I think it's such a shame. And it's like, you know, we, we're really missing out on those kind of meaningful conversations that we could have. How? I guess I want to ask, do you have any tips on <laughs> talking to having meaningful interactions with strangers? And and why do you think that is something that w is so alien to us when really it should be it should be the most natural thing in the world, like human connection? My narrow version of the tip would be move to a foreign country and start learning the language. Interesting. <laughs> but the broadly understood version of the tip, if you don't want to do that or can't, is have some other thing that you're consciously learning and trying to improve at. Even if the thing is literally the skill of talking to strangers, I find even the thinnest veneer of a mask that depersonalizes it a bit really gives you a confidence in going about it. So when I first started speaking German in Berlin, where I now live, obviously I was nervous, but because I had a thing that I was focusing on that wasn't me as a person, it was rather the specific domain of my German skill. It then made any perceived rejection or failure much easier to take than if I had the mindset that all of me was being rejected or failing. So I would imagine that's transferable to just going today, I'm going to work on my skill of talking to strangers. And if it doesn't go well, maybe it's not about me at all. But if it is, maybe it's just about the small region of me that's associated with talking to strangers. Mm. So make it less personal, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a really good tip. And and then just to go back, why do you think that we have lost that ability? Do you think it's just the, do you think it's a pandemic thing? Or was this kind of, because that, that um, piece I wrote was before the pandemic. And I feel like now having had those periods of lockdown and isolation, we're even worse at interacting with people we don't know. I think to some extent, it's a city thing. And probably to the extent that life becomes harder and harder, that's going to make people less patient and more aware that time is scarce. Even when it's not literally scarce, I think even when you nominally have free time, if you feel straightened in your circumstances, that time is another thing that will come to feel scarce and you won't feel as generous with it. But I find in rural Ireland, for example, people are still exceptionally talkative. But I find even comparing London to Dublin, both capital cities, I find London is less talkative. And I think it's to do with efficiency. I think efficiency can almost work against human connections sometimes. Yeah. So in Dublin, you're much more likely to be stuck waiting for a bus and the next bus won't be for 30 minutes. So you, you might as well talk to someone sometimes in that scenario. It happens less often in Dublin than in the countryside, but it still happens. Mm -hmm. Whereas in London, the next bus will be in five minutes and that's great for getting to where you want to go, but it's not good for finding those moments where you aren't going anywhere and you're just enjoying being there. Yeah, it's so true. It's such a loss. It makes me sad that we don't have that because you're right. It's like, yes, we can like click our fingers and order anything we want. It can be here in minutes. We can get the tube in two minutes. But the thing that we're all lacking and the reason why, you know, we're all so lonely, you know, that's a proven stat about loneliness going up is because we don't have those kind of daily meaningful chats with people anymore. Yeah, and it's ironic because in some ways we've never been more available to one another, mm -hmm. but it's remotely and it's via WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe if the standpoint is that you can text your best friend anytime, you don't feel the same compulsion to have a conversation with someone that you might never see again. Yeah. But I always feel so much healthier and secure in my close relationships if I'm having a lot of fleeting encounters. It gives me so much more sense of perspective and distance. And then I'm able to come back to my deep friendships with, I suppose, a feeling of lower stakes that lets me be myself around the person. Whereas if I've only got a tight circle that I'm talking to, then if anything goes wrong, as it inevitably does sometimes, it feels much huger and much less fixable. 
Um, finally, before we wrap up, can you tell us anything about what you're working on next after The Happy Couple? I'm writing a novel because it's my favourite form, but whenever I say something publicly about a novel, the very next thing that occurs to me is, I should really change that. <laughs> so <laughs> in order to keep it about the things that it's presently about, I'd better not say anything. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I understand. Thank you so much for joining us. That is it for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and watching. You can listen and watch all of the Love Lives episodes on Independent TV. You can also catch us on all major podcast platforms and all social media platforms. I will see you soon. Bye.